inshallah, uh, due to time, we'll swiftly move on to the next workshop, inshallah. I would like to introduce Sister Naima. Sister Naima is a naturopathic doctor with experience of almost 10 years, subhanAllah. She's a wellness educator and a skin diagnostician. She specializes in natural fertility and skin diagnosis. She is currently also a master student in medical sciences, infection and immune. Sister Nama believes in continuously striving for balance in all aspects of life and continuing holds workshops to educate others on for, for, uh, forming a healthy foundation to build the balance on. Um, she's going to be holding an online workshop in two weeks time called the Foundations of Health, which you can find on her Instagram page, Naima underscore Naturopath. Inshallah, whenever you're ready, Sister Naima, let's begin, Inshallah. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. That was a very nice talk that I listened to with from um, Brother Nam and that um, the Dua. Um, so, inshallah, I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so, if everyone can just, you know, say you can hear me, um, I'm going to be just reading through the um, chat group. Okay, yeah, great. I can hear all your responses. So um, thank you to the AFOSIS um, organization for inviting me on and I'd like to um, make dua, like may reward, may Allah reward all the organizers and even in communicating to me, there was like a very high level of Ihsan. So I can see there's a lot of um, work or a lot of quality work that's been put into organizing this. So may Allah reward you all. So I'm going to start by um, sharing my screen. So my topic today is wellness in turbulent times. So let me just do this, share my screen. Okay, so my first question to you is, what does wellness mean to you? And if you would like to just share your answers in the chat group, because we're living now at a time where it's, you know, very unique. You know, we're living at a time where there's a pandemic that, you know, probably one of the only pandemics, inshallah, that we ever have to actually live through. Um, and how did we get to this, you know, uh, you know, it certainly in my clinic, I've seen that um, overall immunity has gone down. You know, and if we look at statistics, lifestyle um, diseases are now more on the rise rather than before, where it was more infections and uh, things like that. So let's have a look here at the chat. Okay, so wellness. Husna said healthy uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Yes, um, spiritually, physically, mentally, compasses. Yep. So you guys are doing very well with the answers. Balance between all aspects of life. All right. Okay. So the World Health Organization defines wellness as um, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. So we're all we're on a similar page here. Um, so if we were to look at now, like if you were to be sick, you know, you'd go to the doctor. But for me, when I'm explaining to my clients that you know wellness starts at a certain level, there's a spectrum, and we will, we will get symptoms and our body continuously communicates to us what is happening on the inside. And when there is an imbalance, there will be a sign or a symptom to let us know that something is imbalanced, something is not right. Um, and that's up to us to actually understand what it's trying to say. So we can look at um, wellness as a continuum that extends from illness to optimal well-being or we should start from optimal well-being to a state of illness. So on one step, on one end, I'll just show you this diagram. Um, on one end, we will have the optimal state of well-being and 
over time, if we're not improving on our health or if we're not supporting the foundations for optimum health, we will then start facing issues. So whether it be something very acute, um, like just a cold or a flu, or whether it be something like energy where it's something more chronic, you know, then you start to move up through the spectrum of wellness where then your treatment that is required is also going to be much more um, concentrated or much more intense. So if we have a look at the diagram here, um, at the very least, when we are you know, laying the foundations, when we are addressing the foundations of our health, of just looking after our, what we need as a human, you know, spiritually, uh, mentally, emotionally, and physically, then we're able to actually be the best that we can be. And we're able then, our vitality is at the strongest. And in every state of being, we are, you know, um, giving ourselves the best experience. So I just want to spend some time on this diagram. So for example, I would say like now the way our lifestyle, um, the way our lifestyle is going, we see things or we have like um, symptoms that we, you know, we're taught to brush aside or, or we're not actually addressing. Um, and like, for example, a sore stomach, you know, what happens if you, you were to have a sore stomach? Do you, do you see the doctor? Um, do you do something for yourself? Do you reflect, maybe someone can share, what do you do when you have, if you were to have a stomach ache? Just wait for it to see if it passes. Yeah. What do you? What would you do? So, um, take a medication. So, what medication would you take? Painkillers. Wait, and then have herbal tea. Which herbal tea would you have? Go to sleep. Drink water. Peppermint tea. Mm hmm. Maybe look at what you did before and see if you ate something funny. Yeah. Paracetamol. Mm -hmm. Ask your mum what to do. That's a good one. Mum always has the answers. Find out what is causing it. I like that one. So find out what is causing it. So first of all, you would have to understand what is happening. Okay. So if you always have a stomach ache, if you understand what is happening, then you'll know what treatment you need. Because, you know, we can have a sore stomach for lots of different reasons. And so who was it that said, find out, so Nadia, uh, yeah, find out what is causing it first. When we know what is causing it, then we can look at the treatment. Because if you look at this diagram as well, you know, is it something very, very severe where we need a high force of intervention? Or is it simply just a bloating that, you know, you could use, you know, fennel, peppermint tea, that will just help at ease. And some people will just ignore it. Yeah. And this is a lot of the things that we're taught to do is just ignore something small like that. You know, you know, what is a stomach ache? It's not really an issue. Um, and if you were to go to the doctor for just a stomach ache, then you could investigate. But most does anybody go to the doctor for a stomach ache? Okay. Yeah. So back in the days, we we knew what to do. We knew what to do with the stomach ache. We didn't have to go to the doctor for a stomach ache unless it was chronic. Um, not unless it has gone away, hasn't gone away for a while. Yeah. And so if you look again at that spectrum, it can get to a level where you need to have that um, maybe suppress. So paracetamol would suppress the pain. So you're just suppressing the symptom without addressing it. And what are symptoms? So this symptom would be your body communicating to you something is happening inside. And that's the language of the body, right? It will kind of um, bring your attention to where there is a problem or where there is an imbalance that we need to address. So sometimes a stomach ache would require, you know, um, 
even to a point where you might require surgery because of how chronic, because there is a ulcer or there is, um, you know, a cyst or something like that. And sometimes it would, it would just require a change in your diet. Yeah. Um, and that is what we need to understand about wellness. It is understanding that if we're able to lay down the foundations to support health, to support wellness, then the body does have an innate um, intelligence an innate intelligence to rectify that imbalance. And a simple thing like a herbal tea can help. So these are six lifestyle factors that encourage, that encourage um, and support the body just for, for healing. So uh, we'll go over it a little bit later, inshallah. Um, let's have a look here. So, so we looked at the definition from the World Health Organization. Now, in our deen, the Prophet ﷺ said, um, there's a translation, so there is a flesh in the body, if it is good, the whole body is good, and if it is bad, then the whole body is bad, and that is the heart. So the heart, you know, obviously we know it's not talking about the blood pressure, or how well, you know, your blood is circulating, or um, the physical state of your heart, but it's more the spiritual uh, state of the spiritual heart. And if we look into our deen, and as the brother was talking about earlier, I really liked what he was saying that, you know, encouraging faith-based um, activism. So whatever you study, whatever um, sciences you study, you always know that in our deen, we already have the very highest level of understanding of that. Um, and if you're able to, um, I guess, fuse and make sure that, we're having, we have the principles of our deen and apply it to your science, then you can be assured that you're getting the best of the best. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about is we always talk about wellness um, or the diseases that are occurring in today's time being like our health, our state of health is on the decline. While we have the worst of the worst, we also have the best of the best. So um, I've had heard a uh, sheikh, so someone was talking about the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where, um, you know, there was a lot of evil at that time where, you know, um, people were burying their daughters, uh, where, like evil was, was very heightened at that time. But a sheikh said at that time, there was also, you know, that was a time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, there was also the best of the best. So even though we see a lot of things in our, our lifestyle that is, you know, um, we would say like, you know, it's not a very healthy lifestyle and no one's ever lived so far away from where their food source is. Um, you know, we live so detached from, we don't know where our food is from. Uh, we also have, you know, on the other hand, we also have a lot of things available to us in our medical system that was not available before as well. So um, kind of went off on a tangent, but um, so understanding that, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, if we look at his teachings, if you look at his words, we might not find so much things, you know, got to do with our physical health. But when we look at his actions, we see that his sunnah actually display a very big prevention of disease. So if we look at the sunnah, so does anybody want to just um, give us an example of a sunnah and we can relate it back <clears throat> To how it improves our health. In fact, everything in our deen is only good for us. Like we, we know that that everything is good for a believer. And even if we were to look at the science side of it, we will be able to find how it is good for us. Um, drinking honey. Hon okay, so even if we're looking at honey, so that it's a shifa for all. And this is really, really interesting because if we take a look at the occurrences and of diseases in that time, a lot of diseases, a real disease is generally caused by a pathogen. So an external micro, um, uh, microorganism that invades the body and attacks the body's own natural um, balance and causes disease and causes imbalance and causes havoc, right? So these pathogens need to be killed Okay, and an antimicrobial is honey. So when we look at the sayings of the Prophet about honey, about black seed oil, 
The interesting thing is those things that he said that is uh, shifa for most diseases, or almost all diseases, is that they're antimicrobial. You know, we have all these studies now about how bacteria, fungus, yeast can be killed and, you know, antibiotics um, was introduced and how that um, affects, um, you know, the now, the type of diseases that we see. Now the type of diseases that we see are lifestyle diseases. Let's have a look. Um, drinking water in sips. That's another interesting thing. So, SubhanAllah, our deen is amazing and it is full of things that if we were to practice our deen, practice the sunnah, it is only going to improve us. So even looking at the sharia, like when we look at um, the things that is most prohibited or the things that are most fart on us, it generally is for our overall well-being. So if we look at salat, salat, you know, five times a day, is fard on us, yeah? So salat actually helps us on every level of our being, on our spiritual being, our mental, emotional being, and our physical being. And if you want the science as well, there's also um, studies to show how praying meditation will improve, improve um, you know, reduces the risk of Alzheimer's, improves your um, overall well-being, even if you were to look at from a stress perspective and how, what, how stress affects the body. You know, and how salat combats that praying. And even when, um, in terms of prayer, we have like a set of rules, we have wudu where there is, um, you know, a set of instructions on how to make wudu. And it's really quite specific. Yeah, like with wudu, it's, a, you know, some madhabs will say up to the elbow, some will say past the elbow. You know, when you're washing your face, there is a certain, you know, point where you have to reach. And it's there all for good reason. Because one of them, okay, we're, we're not, we're not going to know all of them because subhanAllah, the hikmah, the wisdom behind all of this, we're not going to know everything. But even just understanding that, like one of them, for example, we hear of this practice, uh, you know, that's very common now is being mindful. Um, so um, being mindful of everything that we do. So being mindful, you know, requires us to be present at where we are. And when we are making wudu, we have to make intention, right? So when we're making intention, we're bringing ourselves back to present. When we bring ourselves back to present, that changes our overall state. And when we're making wudu and making sure that, you know, that the water is reaching a certain level, we're also making sure, like, we have to be present to know that it's reaching or, you know, the requirements. And every step of the way until we pray, there's always so many checkpoints for us to check in and be present. And if we're busy, we're just running like um, this very, you know, busy lifestyle. We, we still have much, a lot of chances along the way. If you didn't check in at intention, you know, um, it, when you're making wudu, um, before you start praying, in your prayer, after your prayer, there is just so much um, check, to check in to, to just return to our present self. Okay, let's have a look what else there is. Um, okay, water. So water is an interesting one because I'll have my clients, you know, will check in on how much water are you drinking a day? And almost half, almost half of my clients will say not enough. Um, and they'll probably base it on the two litre recommendations that's mostly given out. But the body will try to make sure that every that the environment of every part is working to the best so for example like in the stomach there is an environment that will suit the function of the stomach so what is the stomach designed to do anybody want to share what is the stomach designed to do to store food digest food Yeah, okay, so let's look at storage of food. Yeah, so if we're going to store food, food is food. You know, when we put food on the bench, what happens to the, like, what's the nature of food? It will go off. You know, there will be um, bacteria, um, bad bacteria that grows on it, there'll be good bacteria that can grow on it. Um, 
so if we're storing this food that has that potential to go off and and grow all this mold yeast bacteria if you're going to store it how would you store it acid yeah so the stomach has a lot of acid it has a, a certain ph it has a certain ph to maintain so that the environment is good now what happens when a person stresses and lives a very fast-paced lifestyle, eats food that is not um, designed for us, you know, if we're eating takeout all the time, um, you know, what happens to the pH of the stomach? What happens to the function of the stomach? So, so for example, let's say um, let's say we have we, we're going to use a since you guys are students, I'm going to use, um, are most of you guys, yeah, most of you guys are students. So let's say I'm going to um, make a scenario where there is a student, you know, they are studying something, they are a, uh, let's see, I'm gonna say science, science student and exam time is coming up and it's very stressful, assignments are piling up. So what do they do? They procrastinating, because students procrastinate um, and then, they're stressing, although they haven't started their work. And then they will start to do their work very late and stay up at night and continually stress about it and probably have to try to work to make sure also they're getting, you know, a money income from somewhere and trying to fit a student lifestyle while working. So we're going to have this scenario of this girl as a science student. Okay, so she, okay, she now is nervous and she wants to eat well she doesn't feel like eating but she wants to she needs to eat so why wouldn't she feel like eating because her stomach is lined with muscles that is involuntary muscles so involuntary muscles means we don't have control over these muscles and the stomach is innervated by so much nerves that's connected to the mind so if if you're stressing your muscles are going to be clenching inside the stomach and if those muscles are clenching within the stomach then the acids and juices of the stomach is not being released so then the stomach no longer has the environment that is best suited to store or digest food so what does the body do as a protective thing is not give the hunger cues it won't give the hunger cues because the environment of the stomach is not at its best to digest food so you can see like that is just an innate intelligence of the body. Um, but we as humans also have the, um, so animals body will just work off their, you know, those symptoms, those cues, and they will just go on fitra with what they feel, what they want and what they need, right? Whereas a human, we have the ability to discern what is good for us, what is not good for us. So even though we have we don't have the hunger cues, this girl will know I haven't eaten all day. I should eat something. So what would we do is we need to protect the stomach, we need to support the stomach and relax the stomach and then eat your food. But even like so if we were to go back now to filling your stomach with a third water, a third air, um, and a third food, again to maintain that environment that the stomach is going to be um, at the best to do its job of storing food, of digesting food, of absorbing the nutrients from your food. And again, so just wanted to show that, you know, that's part of our sunnah. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay. All right. So let's move along. Okay. So as a human, we are spiritual beings at our core and we've got our mental emotional level and we've got our physical being as well and they all affect each other like we can't you know um i actually want to ask you guys you you probably have been in a situation where mentally emotionally you are not great and it has affected your physical well-being or your physical well-being is not great and has affected your mental emotional being okay what are what's an example i'll give some examples after i hear your answers 
So what's an example of a mental emotional state that is, you know, an imbalance probably maybe, and how does it affect your physical? So tired, tired become, tired is a physical symptom. Okay. So being tired, so fatigue is a physical symptom and how would it affect your mental emotional being? So when you're tired, you're going to be less motivated to do much. No, and so imagine being tired all day and you are, you know, supposed to come up with ideas or, you know, your job requires you to come up with ideas. How are you going to, you know, come up with ideas when you're tired? Um, you feel useless, unproductive, so you sleep more because of lack of motivation and so on. Yeah. Okay, so anxiety is a interesting one because, again, our stressful lifestyle, what stress leads to is anxiety so um, anxiety causes heart racing but what does what else does anxiety do so with a lot of the clients I see that are anxious they they might wake up with anxiety and then that stops them from doing whatever they would normally do in their routine of the day um, but another thing that I really want to point out is the physical, you know, the physical being affecting our mental emotional. So someone said when they're tired, um, that's going to, you know, cause you to be less motivated. And if you're continuously tired, well, you're going to feel depression. So depression can occur. Um, but I also wanted to point out, so when we combine, you know, the sciences, I like to combine the science, both, you know, what, what modern science has, you know, um, taught us as well. Um, is that depression and anxiety can also come from a physical symptom, uh, just a physical state of being deficient in certain nutrients. So there is studies on iron deficiency, you know, leading to um, anxiety. And if we were to look into that, we can see the, um, we can actually see how that happens, you know, and vitamin D as well, vitamin D, a deficiency in vitamin D is really going to, be able to push you in a state of depression as well. All right, let's see what else we have here. Yeah, so it becomes a cycle. If you're emotionally burnt out, then you physically can't do much, which then causes stress because now your list of things to do just keeps increasing. And then it's just a cycle that, you know, we need to kind of address. This is another thing is addressing things as soon as they happen. So if we go back to that, um, let me just go back here. So if we go to, um, yeah, so if we go to, oops, okay, this drawing thing is not going to be great. Uh, let's undo, erase that. Ah, okay. So if we start at wellness, there's only going to be one symptom that we're going to be faced with initially, right? So we're well, everything is all good. And we start off maybe with iron deficiency. Obviously, we're not, we don't know that we're iron deficient. How would the body you know, communicate that we are iron deficient? Anybody with iron deficiency know? So iron deficiency is something that is very, very common. And People think if you just take meat, if you just eat meat, that, um, you know, that that's going to help. And then they wonder why, you know, they eat meat and they still have uh, iron deficiency. So you can get dizzy, you can get, you can be tired all the time. Yeah. So when you get blackouts, it's probably really bad. Your iron, your iron must be very low and you start getting blackouts. Um, hair loss. And, and if you can see here, these are very extreme symptoms. Um, fatigue is something, I guess, not so extreme, but at fatigue, sometimes we don't go further to find out what the problem is. Once it becomes extreme, like blackouts maybe, or uh, feeling dizzy, then we'll go and do the investigation. And by that time, now we'll need, you know, eating meat and in, introducing me to a diet is no longer enough. So we need to then move up to a synthetic symptom relief or you know, supplementation where, um, okay, so what else happened? Let's, let's go to the extreme, high force intervention. What happens when we um, have really low iron? One of the things you can do as uh, women can bleed. So um, 
uh, you can actually bleed too much when you have really low iron. So you would need to suppress that bleeding. And okay, if you went that bad, you would need just a um, your iron infusion, iron or supplementation, natural symptom relief of um, iron deficiency would then probably be the diet. You know, making sure that the your um, that your diet contains you know foods that are high in iron. Um, but if we look at the damaged organs, so iron is supposed to be absorbed by the stomach, by the gut. Now why isn't it absorbing the iron? So if we were just very early on, we and we didn't have to go through you know the suppressing the pathology, we're just looking at our diet and understanding that our state of our stomach has not been great because lately I've not been eating um, you know good food and I've generally just been bloated for a while. And so our state of our stomach is impacted and we can just restore that environment and the body will be able to absorb the iron again. But generally when someone has, you know, ha had these extreme um, symptoms of iron deficiency, you'll need that supplementation. So let's just go back now to where mouse. Oh no, now the scribbles. Okay. Okay. So okay, so when we as soon as we notice the symptom, as soon as we notice that there is an imbalance the body will, uh, first of all, try to rectify that imbalance, but we should understand what we should do to support the body as well. So even the Prophet ﷺ has said, so one of the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ is take care of five before five, and he lists the fives, and one of them being your horse before you're sick. So again, like I was saying, in the in the actual sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, there is, um, there is a very big, uh, focus on prevention. So even though spiritual, we are at our core spiritual, and then we've got the mental emotional and then the physical, but the physical can affect the mental emotional, the mental emotional can affect the spiritual. And um, all right, so our six lifestyle factors, our six lifestyle factors uh, forms the foundation of this wellness for, for us to be well, to encourage wellness, to encourage our vitality. And our, um, the, if we look at the increase of lifestyle diseases, we see the importance of making sure that we are addressing these lifestyle factors. So a little exercise for you guys to do is list the six lifestyle factors. Okay, and for each li lifestyle factor, Give yourself a score out of 10, 10 being the best that you could be. So physical activity and rest. So that balance of physical activity and rest, how well do you do that? So how well are you like, um, you know, making sure that you are not living a sedentary lifestyle, but you're also having time to rest. Mental activity, is your mind always stressing about something? You know, do you have that... Um, stress so just just go over it just write it down um yep okay we'll start to wrap up so maybe what you guys can do is write one to six you know and give you uh, with all these um lifestyle factors and give yourself a score out of 10 for each of them and like i said 10 being the best that you could be and what you would do is start on the one that you have the lowest score and that would be the area that you really need to improve on. On the fourth point, so elimination and retention. That So that is actually going like your bowel motions, um, going to the bathroom, um, and even breathing, like if you have any blockages in your nose, so expelling. So we also, we eliminate from via our bowels, um, our urinary tract, our... Um, 
our breathing, so our lungs and our skin. So elimination and retention is how much do we eliminate the toxins that we eliminate and how much do we keep. So we need to make sure that there is a good flow. Obviously the bowels being the main um, pathway of elimination. So if that's blocked or if there's any problems there, that's going to cause blockages in the pathways of the other elimination pathways. Okay. Air quality is more about your environment. Environment. So how often do you go out in nature? You know, are you always in a um, in in a air conditioned room all the time? In outdoors, is it all, like where you live? Is it always polluted? Sometimes, you know, those are things that you can't control if it's pollution in the air. I always talk about like making sure that you know there's all these conspiracy theories, especially you know, got to do with the whole COVID quarantine. Don't look at the things that you can't control. Focus on the things that you can't control because there is a lot of things within your control. There's a lot of changes that you can make. And if you focus on that, you will, you will improve your health. So on the things that you cannot control, let them go. Okay. So, okay. So going by your scores, like I said, go to the one that is the lowest score and spend, that will be your like homework, I guess, although um, shall we meet, but not sure when that would be as I'm from Australia, um, but uh, we never know. Um, so that would be your homework for yourself to focus on that, look up on what is best for you, your lifestyle, on how to work with that. Okay. So I think we can go to any questions now. And if there's any questions, inshallah, from the attendees, just drop it in the chat box and Dr. Naima will answer, inshallah. How can we contact you? So what I'm going to do is share um, Dr. Naima's Instagram page and uh, an upcoming upcoming course that she's doing. So if that's where to contact you or if you have anything else, just Naima, please do. Um, yeah, so uh, the Instagram page is generally a good way to contact if you are in the UK. There is an email address at the end of my slide. I'll just um, probably just, do, are you going to give out the details somewhere? So I was going to do is I was going to share this inshallah. So here, if everyone can see Dr. Naima's Instagram. So if you can message her there, or if you want to share your uh, email address, that's also perfectly fine, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, I think this is a course that you're doing uh, in about two weeks' time. So if any of the attendees would like to take note of this and sign up, inshallah, feel free to do so. Yeah, that's a five-week course, which we will talk about the um, foundations of health. Um, it's very interesting topics, and it's something that's very practical that we can make changes, inshallah. Okay, so should I just go through the questions or will you go through the questions? Um, if you feel comfortable, then please feel free to do so, inshallah. Okay, is mindfulness essentially taqwa? Yeah, so mindfulness is being conscious of every action that we're doing. Um, and yeah, that, that's right, it's essentially taqwa. And so if we um, look at every aspect of our life, what when we're eating, you know, being conscious of what we're eating, is this going to be you know, a slow form of poison, or is this going to be a slow form of medicine? Everything is either for us or against us. So being consciously aware of what every choices that we, um, decisions that we make, ch uh, choices that we choose, how is this going to help me? Um, okay, so we have a few questions. Um, how do we go about being healthy and eating healthy in, in households that main diet is made up of rice and oil and red meat? So um, essentially, there are a lot of countries that have rice, oil, and red meat as their staple. Um, you would, number one, go to your staple foods and just change the quality of your staple foods. So you don't have to go to the extreme and you know, do something dram dramatically different. Um, so looking at rice quality, looking at the red meat quality, and probably just 
adding the vegetables, the plant, um, plant sources as well, and probably spices as well, making sure that, you know, that the meat is being able to be digested. How would you recommend dealing with mental stresses with calamities that are over a long period of time? Okay, so this requires external, you will need a professional to help you along with that. So you would need to seek you know, professional advice. Um, whatever the problem is, you know, you look to a professional because in that cycle, so if you're in a vicious cycle, then it's going to, um, you can't just rely on your own self, if it's, especially if it's something chronic, you'll need external help. Okay, so we will, I think there's time's up. So inshallah. Yeah. Yeah, so due to a time constraint, inshallah, we'll end it there. I will, yeah. Myself, on behalf of Team Fosis and the attendees, I would like to pass my gratitude for you taking out your time. I understand you're calling from Australia and the time difference is quite large. So Jazakumullah yeah. khairan. Uh, may Allah reward you for your yeah. efforts and increase you in your stays in Jannah to Jannah, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. I mean, thank you. Thank you for having of me. Of course, always. It's been a pleasure. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.